Mr. Vandeslice. How are you, Peter? Not too bad, not too bad. Yes. There's a party in the background. On the beach. There you go. Look at that. Um, I didn't. How do I change my name? I got to figure out how to change my name. Why, well, you're not Kristen Taylor at Nahant.org? <laughs> no. I, I want to know how you got that name. Um, I when you when you schedule the Zoom meeting, you have to log in as Kristen Taylor at Nahant.org. Oh, okay. So when I start the meeting, I also have to log in as that. So it just okay. figures that's who I really am. Peter, before we start. Yes. You've been on the school committee, right? I have. So I was by, I talked about this with Bob. So um, Deborah and I have been the co -li liaising, mm -hmm. I pronounced that, for mm -hmm. the school committee. But we were wondering whether you should take some of that over this year because it's a really important year in terms of hiring a new superintendent. And you've got the background information that we don't have. What do you think? Absolutely. Huh? Um, huh? I, I actually was involved in, um, so we went from a full-time superintendent when I was on to the part-time model, which is what I think they're using now. So, yes, it is. Yeah. Um, so the, my cat. <laughs> my daughter's cat so the yeah so yes i'm very familiar with it and uh the other thing is and i i don't know i it, at some point it maybe it's something i can talk to the school committee about so when i was on this when i was the chairman of the school committee there was a guy in on the swamp scott school committee his name was dave whalen he has since passed away he died very young and it was uh, pretty sad it was just after he completed his term, but him and I actually sat down and had lunch one day about, um, and he, he kind of approached me, why, if we're tuitioning our students to Swampscott, why wouldn't we discuss having almost regionalizing with Swampscott? And I think that the downside was for us when I brought it back to our school committee was how do we have a seat on their school committee or how, how does that work? Like does, does Nahant become the, you know, the stepchild of Peter, you know, Peter, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to stop. Right. Cause we've got to, but Peter, you, yeah. have, this, you, this need, is... you mean, you need to do this. So we'll talk more. <laughs> okay. thank you. Yes. Yeah. All right. I, it's, I mean, and only, I, I don't. Only it, four this, of us we on? need to have this conversation, but we need to call the meeting to order. Yes. Oh, okay. And okay, what time? It's seven. It's by what time is it? Six thirty exactly. Yep, six thirty. So, so we only have four members. Are we a quorum? We are. I believe so because it has to be one more than a majority of the from of the committee as it you know the committee as it sits as it sits and and did i hear correctly that julie tarmy stepped down yes oh. and and apropos of that <laughs> um i will take the minutes for tonight okay but i am not going to become <laughs> i can't do being oh, never do a bad job full wow. committee <laughs> i can't yeah yeah but i'm going to be doing CPC and I will help on school committee if you, you know, we'll talk more, but I just yep. can't do it. I'm writing a book right now and I just. Oh, you're writing a book. Yeah. But the point is oh. I, I cannot be a full-time secretary. So I have two <laughs> thoughts on that. One thought is whether or not somebody, and we don't have everybody here to ask this question. Right. So we should come back to it, whether somebody should wants to volunteer. Right, right. That's one one option. And the other option is to take turns. Is to take turns. Exactly. 
Well, we have two empty slots. Presumably, we might find a likely candidate among the uh, newcomers. Joy. Right. Hi. <laughs> We're just wondering if there's Joy? someone who might want to volunteer to be the secretary. It's an easy mm -hmm. job. No. <laughs> <laughs> My my plate my plate is full, and if I volunteer for one more thing, um, I'll be divorced before my first anniversary. <laughs> oh. I, and I I concur. Get a head that. start. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I'm actually um, a terrible secretary. Um, I get very involved in the conversation. I don't take good notes. I'm a procrastinator. I'm not good at typing them up. I would be a terrible secretary. Well, we're, if we don't get a volunteer, what's going to have to happen is we're going to have to rotate it around. Yeah. Yeah. Because oh. I just, I can't do it. I've got, yeah, no, I, I've got a full plate too. Let's, yeah. let's alert, let's alert Dave to the shortfall area as he appoints the empty slots. There right. we go. So yeah. how many, uh, did you call the meeting to order? Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, I didn't officially call it to order, so I'm calling it to order. Mm -hmm. Now we have a quorum. 633. Okay, thank you. Present from the Finance Committee, Vanderslice, Beatty, McMack, and Doherty, uh, and Deborah Warren has joined us as well. We're full Allison. house. Allison has joined us as well, although she is not an official member of the committee. It seems like yeah. a vital contributor, though. Totally. <clears throat> All right. So, okay. Um. So what 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 I would propose, and Barbara will come back to you in just a second, is in in a couple of weeks, once we get Thanksgiving behind us, I will schedule another meeting, and it will just be an organizational meeting to get ourselves organized for the town meeting season, so we can uh, do our draft schedule. I'll have a straw man, which is just going to be a list, basically, with some dates beside it of who's responsible for being the secretary for each of those meetings. If you miss a meeting, it doesn't count. You just get to, we just push everybody else out, right? So mm -hmm. if, if the plan is you're going to skip the meeting, you want to, you're want you called to be a secretary for, that will not work. But, but uh, then you don't get to skip your turn, right? Like, you can't just not show up on the night that it's your right. turn. Well, if you don't show up, you're gonna, you get it the following week, the following week. Exactly. Chelsea, and you have to do two in a row. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's That could be dangerous. I don't know. I'm kind of liking that. Anyway, um, but we'll, we'll, we'll have an organizational meeting. We'll figure out uh, what the liaison assignments are. Joy, what that means is what we typically do is we appoint one of our committee members to be a liaison with uh, each of the town departments. So it's it would be your responsibility to work with whoever the head of the department is, really understand the budget, go through it, coach them if there's any yep. you know, coaching needed like that. Okay. Um, so we'll we'll do that set of assignments in our organizational meeting. Um, do you know that uh, Julie has resigned? No. Yes, that's. Oh no. Yeah, I know. That's why we're having this conversation about who's going to be how to how to accomplish the secretary but role. She's, she's well, would she okay, come back right? if somebody else took the the secretary's position? <laughs> Just asking for a friend. <laughs> No, she's she really needs the time to be with family. Yeah, yeah, yep. no, I get it. I get it. And she's um, been doing stuff. She has been doing so many things for the town for so long, but she's decided for good reason she needs time to more time for family. Yep. Okay. Um kind of a question on the fact that we are what are we down? At least two we, members, maybe you know, three. You're you're stealing my my Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's <laughs> good. We are we are down three. So all I was going to say is, if anyone has um, suggestions, please pass them along. Um, and in particular, pass them along to Dave Conlon. Yeah, I have one. I'm going to do that. Okay, yeah, I have one too. Good. I'm, I'm, I I don't know. I'm not sure he wants to do it, but I'm trying to push him into it. Ditto. Right. The person I'm thinking of. We'll see. Yeah, I found that Dave likes to follow his own counsel. Right. No pun intended. 
Um, yeah, so, okay. And so I guess that's what we've got as far as organization and administration. I'm looking to see who's with us. There's another person lurking over here. <laughs> oh no, that's oh. it's Peter that's lurking. He's both big and small now. Um, really? hmm? um all right. Um <laughs> uh it would make sense if you saw what my screen looked like. Okay. Um we were to talk about and and meet with Michelle about the housing production plan. Right. Um, there has been a scheduling conflict that I am not responsible for. I will make that note and then drop that whole portion of the conversation. Um, at any rate, Michelle is meeting right now with the uh, planning board, which also has a meeting scheduled at exactly this time. Um, they were kind enough to move their schedule around to let Michelle go first, or at least let the housing production plan go first in their agenda. Um, they were kind of targeting 640, 645 or something like that to be done. And then Michelle would be able to join us. Good. Okay. Okay. So, I mean, we can like, you know, kind of chat amongst ourselves about it. Tony said he was going to try to join us as well. Uh, I don't see Tony. There was another. Can you hear me? Oh, he said. Can you can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is Tony. Oh, uh, yep, this is Tony. All right, excellent. Thank you. Um. Okay. So. Um, I, I guess we could like take two approaches at this point. We could just say, look, let's adjourn right now and uh, schedule it for a time when we know Michelle will be available or we can continue um, you know, with, with the present quorum and the present set of uh, visiting dignitaries to discuss this. Well, we could also, um, there, there's a, I guess, a quite a flurry of activity going on at the Coast Guard housing uh, property, and an update. Yep. Um, is part yep. I guess uh, that would be entirely appropriate. Right, right. So, um, I don't know if Tony wants to give an update or. Yeah, I'm happy to. Um, so uh, I believe all nine structures have been demolished um, and all eight oil tanks have been removed from underground. Um, luckily, we didn't run into any contamination issues with the underground oil tank, which is a plus. Um, however, uh, on the some bad news that was unexpected is uh, they discovered some under the slab, like almost within the foundation, uh, duct work uh, mm -hmm. that is actually cement pipe duct, duct work that's lined with asbestos. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be a costly um, change order because of the labor involved in it. Essentially, they have to saw cut the cement slab around the pipe work, which almost like spiders from the middle of the foundation to every corner of the foundation um, and remove that carefully. However, um, other good news is that there was about a $60,000 uh, allowance in the bid for damp proofing of the foundations, which doesn't need to happen. So. We're saving some money there. And the oversight, the on-site oversight by Axiom of American Environmental was uh, going to be charged by the day, by the hour. And um, because 
American environmentals move so quickly, we're going to have some savings there. They were estimating 45, uh, 45 hours. And, and I think they really were only out to like, they were up to around like 30, 35 hours the last time I checked. So there should be some savings there too. Um, not enough to account for the increase, the unexpected increase that we're going to deal with, with the asbestos line uh, HVAC or duct work, I mean, in the foundations. But, you know, that, if that was going to cost us, I think originally they estimated around 130,000. But like I said, we're saving 60,000. We're saving maybe another 10. So cut it in half. But ultimately, we won't know the true impact of those dollars until they do the work and tally up the hours. Uh, yeah, but we're we're better. We're way better off than having an oil leak. I mean, an oil leak would have huge. been huge compared to to this. Our, oh yeah, so we are still within our authorization right now. Yes. Yes. Yep. All right. Um, and the, so the plan, the, the plan going forward and and the timeline associated with that is what is is what. So they can't do the asbestos work under the foundation until DEP comes DEP wants to come out and take a look and because of the holiday I bet they won't be out until next week um, once DEP gives it the green light they're going to go ahead and do that work and then they once they pull that out they remove all the foundations um, so we're still probably tracking mid-December um, mid-December to then, begin the sale no, mid December to be done with like, you know, foundations gone. Okay. Um, and Tony, did you say that was one one pro of the properties, or was it more than one that they discovered this asbestos? It's in every one of them. Oh, okay. It's in every one of them. Yeah. Um. So. I've been on the I've been on the phone reaching out to a couple, you know, a few different uh, real estate appraisal companies. Once the land is cleared of all material, uh, we might the DPW uh, may do some uh, leveling of the ground, or we may uh, do that as a change order with Axiom. If we can do it in house, obviously it'd be a much cheaper. Um, but once that part is done appraisals are next uh, I've reached out to a few different companies if you if you guys uh, have you know know of any feel free to email me I'll reach out to them trying to find some companies that are familiar with you know the market in our area um, so the appraisals would be next and then to the board of selectmen uh, with the appraisal numbers to authorize and begin the town and land study committee actually takes those appraisals and submits it to the board of selectmen and then the board of selectmen authorize the next steps of going out to sale. Um, that is where the next, the next step of the process, I think I know how it goes, but we're meeting next Thursday morning with uh, legal to go over that process and timeline and understand kind of how it works with chapter 30 B and, you know, um, putting them up for sale, potentially dealing with, um, you know, real estate brokers and that sort of stuff. So I'm not really, I don't, I don't, have too much to offer as far as details goes with that yet, but I'm going to know more next week. And then what else did I want to mention too? Um, oh, and the other part of that conversation is uh, part of the timing there is 
when we do our bands and our borrowing, if you, if you do borrowing and you sell the property within a certain amount of time of the mature date of that borrowing, it becomes taxable. Otherwise, it's not taxable. Eventually, that will occur, and we'll have to pay tax on some of the borrowing. Taxable um, to the town? Yes, because it's because you're selling the property uh, for private development. Now, um, you know, if you're talking about somewhere around, you know, the tax rate on that would be probably somewhere around maybe 10%. So eventually we're going to have, we will get hit with that because of the timing of sales. We just don't want to do it twice. So what we're trying to do is figure out the time frame of these sales and the time frame of our borrowing. Like we already just did a six month borrowing that matures in January. And we did it that way because we weren't sure if we were going to be ready or not uh, to sell. And we didn't want to run the chance of potentially having to pay taxes. So we did, we did a six month, it was non-taxable because we didn't do any sales in that in that time frame. Now we're kind of coming up to that process again, and that's part of the conversation, uh, you know, with the next step in the process. So, can just can to, I ask? Go ahead. Can I ask by taxes? Do you mean the tax stamps when you sell it, or no? What the, what kind of taxes? What kind of exactly? My question. Thank you, Joy. <laughs> If we borrow a million dollars, we don't pay taxes on it because it's a government purpose. But if we borrow a million dollars to, you know, develop land to sell for private purposes, then it becomes taxable. We have to pay ten thousand dollars know, in interest almost on that. But there's no there's no tax on a borrowing. I've never heard of it anyway. Well, the, the other thing is we're not we're not developing the property. The individual owners will be developing it. So if you sign a purchase and sale, an agreement yep. within 90 days of the mature date, that's what triggers it. It's something it's something like that. So um, you know, we're trying to, you know, time that up properly so we don't have to do it more than once. Well, so how does that how does that work with the fact that the board of selectmen through the town meeting was authorized to sell alternating lots over two years? Does that mean we would sell half of them altogether and we'd, we'd come up with a turnover date and then the other half? Um. That's part of what our meeting is going to be talked about on Thursday. We're going through that. So I'll, I, I can't answer it right now, but essentially you're trying to predict when you think you're going to be putting these, when you think you're going to be signing a PNS. And if it's going to be within 90 days of that mature date, you know, are we going out for six months or are we going out for a year on these borrowings? That's, that's how we're trying, you know, that's, okay. that's kind of the conversation Tony, that we're going to be having. Tony, would you be open to having a representative from the FinCom attend that meeting? Um, I'll think about that. <laughs> yeah. And Tony and or Allison, can you send over some more information about whatever? Jo this is what Joy threw in the chat as well. Is Allison on the call? Uh, yes. Yeah. Because I've, I've never Allison, did heard I, of tax on borrowing. Allison, did I explain that? Can you explain that better? So I, I think what we're trying to say is um, right now when we issue bans, they're tax exempt, which allows us to sell at a lower interest rate. They're if we they're tax exempt to whoever is buying, correct units, 
the bond, Correct. right? Right. So yeah, so you you get a better price because whoever is buying it doesn't have to pay tax on that income. Exactly. So if we sell the properties to you know private developers, we cannot issue tax exempt bans to continue to finance you know this project because it's no longer our property. So that means that we. Uh, if we still need to to borrow to pay for the for the project or if we're not if we don't sell enough property to pay down the bans in full we're going to, at some point to have to issue taxable bans which will come with a higher interest rate so this so it seems a bit no unlikely Okay. Well, but one thing I think we've established, this is not a tax to the town. This is whether this is taxable to the purchaser of the, of the munis. Of the munis. That's correct. Yes. Yeah, but it makes them less desirable. It, right. right. It makes them less desirable. If I buy bonds that I don't have to pay taxes on, I'm going to do it. So I'm um, speaking, we spoke to our financial advisors yesterday that we use, and I don't know the interest, you know, the difference between interest rates. And we kind of asked them, what's the market like now? And they said it's probably a difference of at least a percentage point. So, um, it, but it's just something that, you know, we have to keep in mind as the project goes forward. Okay. So it almost makes it more desirable to sell as sure. much as you can pay off the loan and the secondary loan that we took out for demolition. Correct. Yep. And if, so if you right now if, are the bands that we have right now are expiring in January. The question is, should we issue another six months of bands? Should we issue a year? Should we because we have other borrowings too that it's all rolled into one should we split right. out just the coast guard housing borrowing so these are all the questions that we're kind of tossing around right now can would if you can send along something that describes what triggers the uh non tax exempt borrowing um i think i can answer that question and what it is is should the town enter into a profit-making venture? Uh, at that point, we can't issue munis. Munis are for town debt that is related to town infrastructure and things that we would ordinary that would be part of the town's ordinary business. If the town decided that we wanted to put up a restaurant that made money, we couldn't issue munis for it. Right. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Are, wait, are mu what you're calling munis, Dan? Is that municipal uh, mu bonds? Yes, munis are tax-free municipal tax, bonds. Tax -free the reason they're attractive is they're tax-free. Exactly. So, so yeah. they're, they're great for retirees. Uh, a lot of safe, you know, safe investment people love them because they're very safe. They they don't pay a lot of interest, but you yeah. don't have to pay taxes on them. So depending on your tax bracket, it can be a home run. Got it. Thank you. So it's that money making. Okay, I, I got it. Hey, so um, kind of a um, a couple of things. Um, the and and I don't even know if this is maybe the right place to bring it up, but um, I was on a an email, and Tony, you tell me if I can even bring this up or not. But the email that we got from Tom, and I don't know. He had some questions about what was happening at this, the property. Yeah, uh, actually, I talked to Dan Script today about that. You know, a lot of. So first of all, um, keep in mind that you know we must follow the motion at town meeting. Right. So even if sentiment was a little bit different, based on the recommendation of the committee, it's the motion not even the article, the motion that rules, right? Yep. So, um, but Dan and I both were talking today and I think we both at the same time said, we need to talk to Peter Barba. <laughs> so <laughs> I was hoping to catch up. I was hoping to, Dan and I were hoping to meet with you to kind of walk through his email and see 
if you have some memory of some of those those items um but we you know we we obviously don't have any intention of yeah, i think one of his concerns was that the property line goes into the street and you know we're obviously not going to be uh it's, we're going to make sure that we have the proper easement there or whatever right right it's it that the a and r i believe Anyways, yeah, let's you, you, me, and Dan, you, Dan, and I uh, yeah. should catch up on that email and and walk through those questions. Yeah, I, I mean, most of it, most of it, it sounds like we're following. Um, you know, I think the leveling was a, um, and I even had this conversation. So, you know, Tom had mentioned something about leveling the property, and and yes, it, it is in the motion to level the property, but to what extent? Um, you know, we did have a presentation right. that had, you know, lot, um, what do you call it? elevation lines and things. And even Tom and I kind of disagree on what that actually meant, um, only because he's his vision was trucking soil away. And mine was more about leveling the, the, the lot. So, um, again, yeah, we could talk about it. All right. Cool. Peter, with Tom, nope. I need to be able to put that in the minutes. With... What's that? Tom Hamilton? Tom. Ham Hamilton was on the... Oh, uh, Tom Hamilton. Um, yeah, got it. Yeah, he was, he on, was the, on the committee. Yeah. Okay. On the Coast on the Housing Committee. Correct. And, and, got it. and just for everybody's knowledge, only because I had to write it like a million times, it's the Coast Guard Design and Development Advisory Committee. Try saying that five <laughs> times fast. <laughs> no, wait, wait, Coast Guard? I'm going slowly. Coast Guard Design and Development Committee. Ad advisory. Committee. Oh, advisory. Okay, see? Thank you. Okay. So I think that is our update. Yep. And we well, I, I have one, one question. I think Tony might have uh, some insight to it. Uh, my, my, my question is simple. Uh, we don't have Michelle here, unfortunately. Oh, she's, she's, we, we no, do she's have... on. Okay. Well, let's here. Join. Yes. My, hey, Michelle. Hi, Michelle. My, my, my question is, joining us. is there a belief among town leadership, uh, and per your discussion recently with town attorney Dan Scripp, Tony, uh, as how to interpret the article at town meeting and the amount of uh, flexibility that that allows the selectmen can the selectmen at this time, without a subsequent article and a subsequent town meeting, allocate any of those lots to be used for other purposes than as described in the article, especially uh, affordable housing? No, I, I the, the belief, any, any change, anything outside of what the article approved, uh, would only be possible with another article. So, amongst town leadership, it's follow the follow the letter of the motion. Okay. Yeah, the, and and it's funny because you know over the past you know week or so, I've been doing a little bit of research, and one of the things I did do was I pulled up the motion, and I actually have it typed out and you know readily available if anybody you know is interested. But it's we were very and and I wasn't even on FinCom at the time, um, but whoever uh, wrote the article was was very good in being very specific about um, everything that the uh, was presented by the the Coast Guard Design and Development Advisory Committee. Um, so it is very specific. Um, Peter, can I ask though? Does it say we cannot? Is there a not in there? Like we cannot use it for affordable housing? Like, it doesn't, no, no. Basically, no, I mean, it there's, mention that. you know, the, the first part of it speaks to the, the lot number and parcel and what it's identified. So I'm not going to read that. The existing houses, so the, the yes, we're authorizing the selectmen um, to, under the following conditions, you know, sell the real estate. So that the existing houses are demolished, the in-ground oil tanks removed, the land is leveled. The land is subdivided and subject to any title issues being resolved 
12 individual lots are sold with deed restrictions prohibiting any single individual entity or group from purchasing more than one lot, prohibiting lots from being combined with any other lot, and limiting the maximum floor area ratio of said lots to 25%. And to further reduce construction congestion, authorize the Board of Selectmen to sell alternating lots in two offerings over two years. That's the exact wording. <clears throat> Thank you. So, I mean, like I said, there's also the, the, um, and in the appendix of your book for the special town meeting that we just had is the transcript from right. that meeting. Um, we actually pulled it right from the transcript of the entire meeting. So we, the motion is in one of the appendices of the finance committee report from the last special town meeting. Yeah, I actually got this off of the transcripts that are, and, and if anybody's interested, they are, you just look up town meeting um, on the town website and all of the, all of the transcripts are written and that's where I got this. And, and it's kind of funny because in the middle of it, I want to say somebody's cell phone rings and, um, Dave Conlon interrupts Judy Zahora and says, do you want to get that? <laughs> <She's> <laughs> something. So it was pretty funny that even in the transcripts, they had that. <laughs> I want to ask again, though, is because you wait, 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 wait. So Michelle has been kind enough to join us. And I think yes. we, we should move to that topic. Yes, agreed. Thank so, you. Um, Michelle, what I would suggest, well, actually, let me kind of frame this up a little bit ahead of even more. Um, as I understand it, the finance committee at this point has no prescribed role. Correct. So, you know, we're, we're not obligated to produce any sort of opinion or, you know, commentary, recommendation or anything else. And having said that, this is, you know, an advisory committee with fairly broad um, responsibilities, and it does represent, at least most of us, um, some pretty smart people. <laughs> You're not looking at me. I, you know, I'm not looking in the mirror either. <laughs> okay, so Michelle, what I suggest we do is, can you kind of just bring us up to speed with the most uh, recent developments. Um, right. I've already heard you give that speech twice now, so I <laughs> yeah, know. I feel you... like it's been more than twice, but yeah, no, I'm happy. To I, I, I know you're. I know you're well practiced at that. And um, then let's open up the floor and just let you know. Uh, do questions. Sure. So I apologize for members of the public. They're probably going to hear the same thing that I said on the planning board meeting. So as you were aware, we published a draft of the plan on October 24th, and we presented it to the board of selectmen and the planning board for their review and feedback. We scheduled a, um, a joint meeting uh, with both boards so they could um, review the plan and vote to adopt it according to the guidelines uh, dictated by the state. <clears throat> Between the time we published it and that upcoming meeting, we did receive quite a bit of feedback from the public and our stakeholders. And so we decided to take a step back, take a look at some of this feedback that we were receiving, answer some of the public's questions, and then look to reschedule the meeting. Um, there was some uh, very important point in feedback that was provided uh, to the committee. Um, we've started, uh, had some uh, early meetings with MAPC to share them with that feedback. Uh, some more is coming in. And so MAPC uh, is out on holidays and they'll be back on uh, Monday. Um, and once they return, we're going to work with them to update the plan and then get a new version out to the Board of Selectmen and the Planning Board. Reschedule the meeting to sometime around mid-December, roughly. But in between that time, um, the housing committee will meet to review the final changes, accept those changes, and then make sure the plan is available to both boards so they can review it, have ample time to review, see the red line changes, 
and then move to the, the meeting so they can vote to adopt it. This vote is of the both the Board of Selectmen and the Planning Board so that we can send it to the state so they can review it and approve the plan. Michelle, um, can I, um, before you move on, I'm sorry, just so I can catch up, um, what does the MACP stand for? Sure, it's uh, the Metropolitan Area Planning Council. They Thank are, you. Um, you know, like, think of them as like the state's internal consultants. We've hired them to work with us. They've written approximately 20 housing plans around uh, the Northeast region for us in uh, uh, Essex County and such. Um, we've used them, we did them, we use them also on the open space plan. Um, you know, they've been very trusted advisors and have provided us a lot of counsel in terms of how to navigate producing this plan, you know, for the state. Thank you so much. And Michelle, if I may ask, because I've been reading it and I printed most, does that mean that the document, the very detailed and interesting and well-written document, very, um, does that, that says draft all over it, that this is what's going to get revised? Yes, there's going to be some sections in the plan that will be revised. So let me just highlight what, what's going to happen. Um, so in the executive summary, we heard some important feedback around really moving up and um, pinpointing around local preference. Um, local preference is a tool that we can use with developers to help prioritize uh, residents to obtain affordable housing if there is a development that happens. Um, we need to illuminate that further and, and probably stronger in the executive summary. It's buried in the plan. So we need to bring that forward. The other thing we're going to do is I believe we have five strategies. We're going to collapse them to four. We're going to take the strategy that stands alone around Coast Guard housing, and we're going to move that and combine it with the strategy around all town owned land. And just so second, we're going to try you, can you just, I have to get that. So you're going to, could you say that again, please? Sure. I'm taking yes. notes. Oh, no problem. We have five strategies. We're yeah. going to collapse them to four. Yeah. We're going to take uh, the strategy that stands alone around Coast Guard housing and collapse that within the strategy around the town-owned land. So we try to normalize our recommendation around town-owned land in a way that demonstrates to the state that we've done an inventory of our town-owned and land. We have opportunity sites that we could consider to do a development and that they can see that we've acknowledged that, you know, here, basically showing our cards. Here's, here's what we have. We're not that big of a community. We are limited on space, but we're gonna do our best to try to achieve, you know, our safe harbor requirements and, you know, be morally conscious in driving and improving the affordable, you know, trying to reduce the affordable housing crisis that everybody has been, you know, seeing and talking about in the state. Um, the other item that uh, has been very prominent that we've heard feedback of is uh, around, um, a certain categorization around the town regarding limiting or restricting multifamily housing, uh, the use of race in the plan. We talked to our consultants about removing that language, which we're going to do. Um, one of the things that we, you know, was in discussion and this came through the planning board meeting was, you know, um, there's a program going, going on called the Dirty Deeds Project nationwide where they're looking at deeds across the country on properties where there are covenants and restrictions on who can own certain properties. And you have to take this in concept of history around, you know, when communities were setting up, what uh, economic planning was looking like. So things like, I can't, you couldn't sell your property to someone that was black, Irish, Italian, Armenian, Jewish, that kind of stuff. In the haunt, there were 90 properties. None of them have been expunged with that language. But in fairness to those property owners, they probably don't know that they have it. So the Dirty Deeds Project is, you know, trying to identify these properties and eventually go to those property owners and inform them that, hey, you have this restriction on your property. Did you know this? Would you consider removing that language from your deed? So um, very interesting. There's information available. You can go Google it. I was able to find it and I found it very interesting that, you know, Nahant has, you know, this problem like a lot of other communities we're not the only one Lynn Saugus Marblehead Swamp Scott they're all you know they're all being profiled um but it, this is a nationwide project that's going on <clears throat> um as it pertains to us in the housing plan though you know there's language in there that some stakeholders felt probably doesn't represent 
what Nahan is. However, to remind folks, we did remove the ability to build multifamily housing and that was voted at a town meeting in the 60s. Had we left that and allowed multifamily housing and increased density in certain locations, maybe we wouldn't have, you know, we wouldn't be profiled by the state. I don't know, who knows? Hindsight's 2020. But, you know, what, there will be recommendations. We will look at, you know, zoning changes eventually, you know, with 3A uh, to bring back, you know, multifamily housing development and, you know, help, you know, what do you mean bring by, opportunities uh, forward. What do you mean by profiled by the state? So when I make that statement, I think the, the state is looking at communities that made zoning bylaw changes 50 years ago, 75 years ago, that they wanted to create uh, communities that had a certain profile. And so people look at multifamily housing, they look at tenements, they look at communities where those are like in East Boston or a Roxbury, where you have multifamily housing and they think of, you know, the types of residents that live there. Not to say that, you know, I, I'm agnostic to all of this, frankly. So I don't care whether there's a, a multifamily next to me or not. I think housing should be for everybody and we should do our best to provide that to everybody if we can, that, you know, doesn't impact the environment negatively. Mm -hmm. um, but the state, because of the housing crisis, because of the need of economic development, they're looking at communities where if they can, you know, increase density to allow people to live and can and do that in a way that's near transportation, they feel that they're achieving those economic milestones. Yeah, but I, I don't know. I To me, there, there's two separate issues here. You know, one is multifamily housing in Nahant, right, which is an issue. It's a legitimate issue and it needs to be discussed and it needs to be in the housing plan. And then there's an the separate issue is the language in that plan that some people now find inflammatory. Right. And we're going to remove that language. We've had some discussions with our um, consultants at MAPC, and we are in agreement that we're going to start redlining that stuff and taking it out. So I think their, I think their thought process, and remember, they're probably working off of a template or a framework that we used in other communities, for whatever reason, providing that historical reference um, feels that may add value. Um, you know, I, I'm a management consultant, been one for over 20 years. Uh, I probably am immune to some of this. And so didn't really think much of it when I read it. I said, this is interesting, you know, um, but other folks had a different view. And once I heard their feedback, kind of, you know, I have a different appreciation for it. So we will do our best to take that out and try to shape the plan um, and fine tune it so it makes sense for po folks and representative of the community. Right. Got it. Thank you. Um, so, Michelle, will there be, you know, like a tracked version? Where I hope it is that it will be a tracked version. That's, I'm going to insist on it with MAPC so we can be, you know, the committee needs to see it. Yeah. Um, I want to be able to just, you know, we'll track it, PDF it, people can see the changes. Some stuff, some of the changes are gonna be very structural changes. So it may be hard for people to follow. We'll do our best to try to keep it clean. Um, but that's my hope. Great, thanks. Hey, Michelle, this is Tony. I just wanted to add a little bit to that. It was just a note that, you know, we, there's, there's a housing plan, you know, that if it was just going to be for the town of Haunt and stay here at the town of Haunt, it would look one way. And then there's the housing plan that the state needs to approve. And what the state wants to see in the plan uh, may not align perfectly with what, you know, the town of Haunt would like in the plan. But there is a lot of overlap there, too. So right. we're going to do our best to adjust the plan <laughs> because it's important that our residents and our community is comfortable with it. But you have to keep in mind there are, we also have to, you know, we can't adjust it so far that the state wouldn't approve it. Correct. Yeah. And that's yeah. what we want to demonstrate to the state that we can contribute to this 
achieve safe harbor so we can protect our community from a, a, an unfriendly development, but also have guardrails that helps the residents should a development come in, that we have some strength as a community through the housing plan, through bylaw changes that we can you know, support residents should a development come forward, whether it's, uh, and, and this is a development that would not be, uh, you know, by the town, it could be, you know, private property owner may say, I'm, you know, going to change the use of this property. I'm no longer going to be X and it's going to be Y and, um, you know, work with them. Yep. So Tony, you echoed what I've been thinking for a while now. The draft as it exists now, to me, it reads like this is the state's affordable housing plan for Nahant not Nahant's affordable housing plan for Nahant. And you, you may get to the very similar answers, but you know, it's a kind of a different mindset. And it sounds like what Michelle's proposing, it gets us some way anyway, away from that and, and to a more, you know, Nahant friendly version of this. And I, I listened in on a meeting the other night and what struck me was it's it it seems like there's, a substantial number of folks out there that see this as the state uh, trying to do some things that will be detrimental to Nahan, detrimental either to what people are referring to as the fabric of the town or the finances of the town. And and if you read the existing draft with that through that lens, it you know you can see why there's a there's a lot of concern. Yeah, I mean, we want this to be representative of the town and the town's goals, right? We want to help people in our community. And this is really around economic development for people, you know, that are at certain income levels. And it's well, not just- Michelle, people. just just to be candid there, can, we had a long meeting uh, last week where we determined how many in our community would actually be helped or benefited. And it's quite limited. So it comes off a statewide list and our opportunity to reserve a percentage has to have approval from the state. Is that not true? I don't follow your question, Dan. It's well, not you're saying that, to... that not, the hunters will benefit from this. Right. And I agree. House... I agree that one or two will, maybe, but for the most part, they won't. No, I disagree with that. We did a housing needs assessment. Over 600 residents in town are below the median income for the state requirement for affordable housing. And it's right. not about- Our ability to put finish. them on the list it, is limited. No, not necessarily, because in some of those instances, there are residents that own their own home, but are only, may only have an income of X. And they're willing to sell their own home and move into a smaller home or, a small, or an apartment. The problem is we don't have housing inventory. So that's the economic piece of it. Trying to create inventory of housing to help people downsize who are at a certain income level, who are struggling to maintain in the home that they're in. All right. And part of that is, is you know, those those residents who may be at a certain income level and are struggling to pay live in their home, probably struggling to pay their real estate taxes. And they're looking, they're probably looking for an abatement from the town. Or they may forego paying their taxes until they're till they pass and leave the town with a real estate debt until their estate settles. We can look at Howell Road as an example. Now I'm not saying that those there are other examples like this in town. I don't know whether they are or not, but there are examples where people are at a limited income. So our housing data shows that. So it's not about it, part of it is yes, there is an affordable housing piece, right? But there's also a need to create housing inventory to help people. And so that piece, if we have the right development in place, the right developer, the right location, there's a lot that can be accomplished through that. I don't want to get narrow focused the... around whether it's subsidized, low income, right? I want to I'd rather be more broadly focused around creating housing inventory. So question, is the housing production plan committee? only supposed to be looking at a 40B and affordable housing and obviously maybe 3A. Um, and and I, I'm asking this um, because shouldn't the housing production plan include, you know, housing needs for young 
new young families, elderly and veterans that may not meet that affordable housing. So, uh, you know, I'm a young family and I want a small house or I want a, you know, house, but, you know, we don't have any. <laughs> I mean, you know, You're right. I'm a so veteran. I want to. I want to be able to retire in a on a one level ranch, but there isn't any. You know. So is it is it just affordable housing, or is no. the production plan it, supposed to be looking at everything else? It's looking at everything else, and there are goals and strategies in the housing plan that explain to some of that. How do we bring programs to the residents around first time home buyer, right? How do we help seniors make their homes more efficient? you know, whether it's through solar or other, you know, climate resiliency needs. So there are things in the plan that can help do that. And it could also be a recommendation around creating an ADU bylaw. So someone could build, um, uh, you know, a, a, an ADU on their property. They could move into the ADU, rent out the bigger home, uh, allow the family to live, uh, their, their son or daughter and their family living in the in the bigger home while the parent lives in the smaller ADU. You know, there's all sorts of scenarios that can be developed and, and you know, looked at in a way that can help create housing inventory. Michelle, I have a question. How concerned do we need to be about finding and building up enough inventory and community um, hostility to, you know, not just NIMBY, but hostility or unwillingness to for example, private property owners to sell. Do you think that we can really build enough? Um, I think we we have some town owned land. There's a strong opportunity to develop that. I think for the private property owners that um, we've selected, and remember, these are just opportunity sites. There's no guarantee. This is the first time we're doing this. It's a five-year plan. We can make changes within the five years, um, but, you know, uh, there could be on some of those private properties that they decide, you know, you know, maybe I don't want to be the Bayside anymore. And that private property owner decides, I think I'm going to develop that. And he's going to, you know, put condos and he wants to put 20 condos over there. You know, we don't have any right now. He can bypass zoning completely and build and do an unfriendly 40 B. So there's, nothing stopping us to stop the property owner because we don't have a housing plan is the first step in towards safe Harbor. We don't have any bylaws in place to help protect and we don't have anything for the residents. He can build the development, maybe not even allow, you know, a local preference option for us. So these are the things that, you know, are triggers. Um, and I'm not trying to scare people. I'm not using scare tactics. I want to do the right thing for the community. Um, but these are the things that we have to think about, you know, strategically, how can we do this in a way that represents Nahant, still keeps Nahant the way I think everybody wants to, but we still need to have bylaws in place, you know, uh, guardrails, protections that help helps folks. Yeah. Have you, it was, has there been conversation about recasting the goals and objectives to reflect what, I mean, you, you said it very passionately and and it, it doesn't come across that way in the existing plan. The goals and objectives are lost. I don't think we've really, we haven't dived too much detail into the goals of objectives, but I mean, we presented these goals and objectives in, in two housing forums and through the survey, and we've gotten community feedback on them. Um, and there was, you know, good feedback on terms of how to shape the goals and objectives. I don't know... And certainly we've got to talk to, you know, our consultants too. Maybe there is an opportunity. I don't really know. Um, but it wasn't really a focus given the the other questions and feedback we received about the plan. Um, Michelle, one of the things that Mark pointed out late in the meeting last week was, I mean, he came right out and said it, that that we're never going to get to our 40B 10% goal. Yeah, I don't think we'll get there. I, I agree with that. But that we would probably get to glam. And I think so. what I don't understand is why we're not focusing on that glam number. I mean, and and, and I want to ask you, what is what do, where do we stand right now as far as glam? We currently have 2.55 acres 
with the three housing authority sites that we have. Yeah, what I think we need another three acres. Please that explain, don't please explain, on explain it. Glam. Please explain, oh, okay. Glam. Again. Glam. So forty B, forty B is the requirement is that we have ten percent of our right. housing stock is affordable housing. Right, I know Glam that. Glam, and that's is, by number of units. That's by number of units. Right. Where Glam is the num the acreage. There's a it's one point right. five percent of our housing property so it's property that's housing industrial commercial whatever um i i don't think we can include open space and and um things right. like that. um somebody may clarify that me however if we have 1.5 percent of our acreage then we re we reach our 40b requirement by this it's called glam the uh, gross land area. It's general land area minimum. Thank you. General <laughs> land um, area. So if 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 we're currently at two point five five acres, and and I don't know what I would assume that you guys know what the glam number is, we have to get to. Um, why aren't we focusing on trying to get there to reach safe harbor? Because we don't have a single property that's going to uh, for us to achieve glam, and no community in Massachusetts has been able to achieve GLAM from the state. So Nahant would be the first one to really try to tackle it. If we could, however, it's, we have, the law. It's, it's, it's I understand the that, but no community has gotten approval from the state by trying to use GLAM. Right. But if we've done an analysis and the analysis says it's unlikely we're going to achieve it by the, the normal way, then and it looks like we we could achieve it through glam should we not be focusing our efforts on glam and yeah, i mean well, and you say there's not one single property but there are there are several properties I mean, well we could combine those properties and that's the the point that's what glam allows us to do that so if we took graystone road and we were to either I'm going to take Coast. I'm going to keep Coast Guard our housing out, but we'd have to modernize the properties on Spring or Emerald Road and increase the number of units. You know, and then maybe increase if there. I don't know how. I'd have to go look at the map to see how much more square footage there is. Is there an opportunity to increase square footage? I don't know. So Greystone Road is 129,123 square feet, which is 2.94 acres. We're already at 2.55 acres. If we took half of that property, we would meet the three. No, we need more. We need, I think, I believe we need like three and a half. And Greystone Road's not enough. And remember, it's not the entire land. It is the square footage of the total number of units. So say we had 20 units. Oh, it's not land. It's actually the units themselves. It's the units themselves. So there's that combination. There's a, like a mathematical combination that they have. Um, around figuring this out. So we need to stitch together properties to achieve the difference. And so I mean, we don't, we can't just get it in one location is my right. point. Yeah. And, and, and you have nine locations listed and I can, I, and I know <laughs> through the being at the meeting that you didn't include private property, um, meaning private residence property with residence residences on them is what I understood. You didn't include any, um, you know, properties that literally people live on as a house. However, no, we didn't. The The opportunity sites that are private property owners are all have some type of business or service use. Right. And, and I guess my point is that when I start looking at all of the sites that you have listed and start including, I mean, if you've included privately owned sites and, and you yourself brought it up and, and Mark brought it up the other night and said um, a landowner could the guy that owns Bayside could turn around and turn it into a 40B likewise co so couldn't Carter Smith or yeah. the cop, they you know and, and again if you took Carter Smith's property you're looking at uh, I think it's it's 2.4 acres and the costings are like 3.6 acres so Again, you know, as far as the property that's there, I think I just think that we're we're trying to appease the state 
just by appeasing the state and not literally giving them a plan that one is good for Nahant, but actually does something that we can actually do, which is get to a number. Because we, if we can't get to the 10 percent, then what do we why are we focusing on it? We should focus on something that we can do. And, and so, it just, I mean, the 10 percent is just dictated by the state. I agree. And I don't think we're going to achieve it, but I do think we'll achieve something and demonstrate, you know, one percent, one and a half percent. I don't know what that number is. It really dictates, you know, what the board of selectmen decide, you know, where they want to put the the effort and the investment. I can't speak for that. All we can do is put this plan together, um, look to get it approved by the state so they know that we are trying, right? And it's the first instrument in, in achieving safe harbor. And then the board of selectmen and the town administrator need to work to figure out, okay, where do we want to start? I'm, there would definitely be further analysis by taking the 10 locations and then down selecting and maybe just focusing on the town owned land. I have no idea. I can't speak yeah. for them, but that's, you know, I could see that as a natural next step. And then figuring out, okay, how can we take Greystone Road, go to the state and say, with design guidelines, we need, I don't know, I'm just surmising, yeah. $25 million to build a development over there, right? And then maybe we move some folks out of Spindrift, go up another level on the Spindrift, right? And, and, and modernize that further, right? Move some folks over from Spring and Emerald Road, modernize those properties and expand a little bit more. This would be, this is a multi-year journey. Um, and it's, again, a multi-million dollars in investment. But if we can show that and then take the next steps with the design guidelines and show how much it's going to cost on our town-owned land, then we have a means to go through our, you know, our representatives and say, we can do this, but we need investment. And we know the state is putting billions of dollars in front of communities now and allowing them to apply for grants for affordable housing. And Nahant needs to be there as well. But we also need the design guidelines to show how we're going to do this and the affordable and a housing plan. Right. I, I mean, so, I will say this. And, and, and you know, I think um, I in attending the meeting last week, what I saw and heard was there's a lot of confusion and a lot of concerns by people that attended um i felt that the committee that your committee is being led by the consultant and not working with the consultant i really felt like okay. like again the the racist part of it the 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 fact that in some in some area i thought i said that they're looking for us to get more than the 10 percent that we should you know, we should do everything in our power to go to, to do more than that. I don't uh, think the consultants, our consultants never said that. Our I, consultants, I think, are, are realistic that we are only so big as a community, right. one square mile. There's only so much land that we can do this. I don't think there was an impression with them that say we're going to achieve the 10 percent. Well, I, I also heard from, you know, in the meeting from a few members that they think that we would be better off to, to remove the three A and what what's the uh, A A A D use A D use because that just confuses everybody and makes it more complicated. Um, so A D use is just a recommendation to remember the housing plan is about creating housing inventory. Forty B is one component of it to help with the affordable housing component but we need to have other instruments to create housing inventory. ADUs does that, doesn't account. You can't use an ADU to account towards affordable housing. We've talked about that. 3A, we have this new statute. We have to achieve compliance by illustrating districts where we can increase density and that's 84 units. And those units can't count towards um, affordable housing, but they can help with increasing in housing inventory. So they yeah. complement the housing production plan because that's what the state's looking for. They're looking for two things, achieving, how can you comply with 40B? How can you economically increase housing inventory to help others who can look to relocate from those large homes to something smaller? And I'm a perfect allow <laughs> I, I have a four bedroom house. I don't need it. I mean, I, I, I know exactly, right? you know, um, it, I, I'm in that situation. I just, Again, I feel that in in what I saw, and I and I think that 
anyone who was at that, you know, at the meeting, watching the meeting, whatever, people are confused. They're concerned. It, you know, I, th I think trying to simplify it. And, and again, even one of your only own committee members said we should separate 3A to try and make it. Uh, yes, what we do, what you do on the production plan is absolutely going to help towards 3A. However, it just makes it more confusing. And trying to get to a simpler plan is going to get people, is going to make it easier for people to understand it and and basically buy into it because because anything that's confusing is really easy to push aside and um mm -hmm. you know and and not accept i mean and that goes for that goes on that, Peter? Income, planning board and and the selectmen so hey this is tony i just want to chime in on that um there was actually a number of things you mentioned i wanted to uh comment on uh, um, try and hit them all real quick. But as far as the GLAM goes, um, no town has been approved by a yes, but we don't know how many towns have actually attempted to meet their obligation by the GLAM. You know, in a lot of other communities, it might make more sense for them to try to achieve it through units than through land area. So, you know, it's not just because none have been uh, approved in the past doesn't mean it's not possible. And our consultants have been very supportive and encouraging about, you know, pushing the state as to why the gland makes more sense for the town of Um And then on the, if you look at the gland analysis, which I think is an appendix of the housing production plan, uh, you'll see um, how they calculated that. And if there isn't photos there, I, I think I've seen them before, how it, you know, take the square footage of the actual structure plus any uh, landscape like or hardscape that's directly associated with the structure like parking or um, where utilities enter the property, all that stuff counts, but not the entire property. Um, so you get a better idea if you take a look at that on how that works. And so obviously you're not going to know until you get to the next step of a process of, you know, what you're trying to develop in any of those locations or ones that aren't mentioned, how um, that's going to factor into your GLAM analysis. That, that's kind of the next step. Um, I would say, you know, you really got to look at this plan as the highest level you know, you're at the widest part of a funnel. And as we go through next steps, things, you know, may come out, new things may get added in. Um, but it's, it's really at that high level right now. And, you know, I think that as far as confusion and what was talked about at the last meeting, um, you know, a lot of the commentary was, was extremely uh, helpful in our understanding of where confusion lies. I think that um, a lot of some of the questions, you know, it was kind of evident that the answers were in the plan somewhere, but it's 130 pages. So, you know, right. who's got time? Who's got time to read every single sentence in that? And but it is there. It doesn't mean it's not there. It's just that you know, it's a big document. It's a it's a large document. And when it, when it comes to the 3A stuff and the ADUs, it's an introduction to those two ideas. Um, I, don't, I don't know if ADUs is really something that the state is looking for us to include in our plan. They obviously, it's a hot topic legislatively at the state house right now, but I can tell you that 3A is 100% something that they want to see us mention in our plan. They want to see that municipalities that are MBTA communities are starting down that road, are considering that. They want to see that we're uh, factoring it in at this point. So, you know, we have to mention it. It's really just an introduction. That's the next six months or so of committee meetings and public meetings is going to be really focused on 
the three A stuff and narrowing that down. So I don't know if we can fully remove it from the plan because I think the state's going to want to see that uh, in order to approve our plan. Well, the the other thing, Tony, is, and, and I don't know legally where we stand, but Michelle said it early at the beginning of the meeting that we actually have a an ordinance or some sort of bylaw that prevents multifamily housing. I mean, I, I, I mean, we're a small community. If you and if you look at not just the if you look at not just the real estate impact, I mean, let's face it. Uh, I don't know that anybody here is going to say that, you know, three three deckers or whatever are, are more attractive than single family homes. But the, the fact of the matter is that we actually have an ordinance that has been on the books that says we don't want multifamily. And I think I'm, I'm going back to say, yes, we don't want multifamily probably because we didn't want the the I don't know the types of families there. But it also has to do with the number of people going into the schools. I mean, when granted, we don't have the, obviously our schools are in need of uh, more students. Um, but back then we had a we had the elementary school, which was smaller, and we had the um, Nahant uh -huh, Junior High. So, you know, we had a lot more kids in school and maybe this plant, maybe this ordinance was put on the books because they didn't want to have multifamilies because we'd have to build more schools. I mean, there's, this could be many reasons why. It was, it was the sixties, early sixties. And it was right around the time when the Bass Point Apartments was, uh, starting to be discussed and eventually was proposed, I think, in 65. Um, and there was a large amount of property on Christopher Drive. There was another large amount of property somewhere else in the hunt. I actually had Diane pull the minutes, the transcripts of those town meetings. And I started skimming through them. I didn't get to read every word either, but it seemed like the town at the time was concerned about similar developments of what was happening at that point apartments happening in these other large sections of, of land that were uh, going to be subdivided and sold. And it really didn't talk about race. I didn't see anything in there about that. You know, I, not that I would expect it, but um, it was more so about like not wanting multiple developments like that in the community. It's actually a pretty interesting read, uh, but it's lengthy. So yeah, but I, it's I, still going. I mean, and that's, you know, that's, that's what I mean. Like, and again, I don't know what our legal, what our, what the legality is for the state to be able to come in and say, you know, you have to, you now have to designate a multifamily. Well, we don't, we don't allow them in town. So, now the state's forcing us to break our own or change our own bylaw. And, and I don't know, again, I'm, I'm asking about the legality aspect of it. If all of a sudden the state said every, you know, we like the color blue, we want every house in the town to be painted blue. Does that mean we just change and everybody paints their house blue? So Peter, what this will entail oh. for 3A is that there'll be a bylaw proposed at the 2025 town meeting that will allow multifamily to be multifamily to be built by right. So if someone has a single family home and they want to convert it to a two family or a three family and it meets within the zoning requirements and they can do it and they have the say for example enough off street parking, they'll be allowed to do it. <clears throat> right. I, now, I, I, I mean and, I understand and it's that. not going to be everywhere in town too. So mm -hmm. one of the things we were we've had some early discussions was do we create certain zoning districts? So for example, Bass Point is very congested. I would not want to see any development in Bass Point, right? And certain, if you have to go street by street, say take Maple App, would I want to put multifamilies on Maple App? Probably not, right? But if you wanted to put multifamilies on the hot road, you probably could because we're, you know, 10 or 12,000 or 15,000 square foot lots, it's plenty of land, right? Could you put multifamilies at East Point? Absolutely. Some of those homes have, you know, could probably subdivide and, and do that. So it's allowing to create those zoning districts and putting those bylaws in place to allow those things to happen. 
All right. And but for you, our, for you the, to... hunt, the, the requirement for the town to hunt is 3A is a zoning requirement. It is not a development requirement. Different Correct. from 40B. 40B is production. You have to actually have the affordable, you know, you actually have to have a certain amount of affordable housing or SHI inventory. You're, um, it's actually a production requirement. 3A is a zoning requirement. It does not require that multifamily actually be built. It's just that the town has to zone for it. And our, our category of town um, as MBTA community, it's an 84 unit. We have to zone enough that 84 units could be built. And there's a couple other things in there, but that's where the next part of the process is going to go through. How do we want to uh, comply with that requirement? There's a lot of pre-existing non-conforming multifamily homes in the town of Ha, probably more than 84 units worth that we could, you know, take that approach. And if those properties uh, meet the criteria of 3A, we could simply say, you know, there's already multifamily here. Let's zone it properly so that it's conforming and meet our requirements that way. Um, those are the things that you're gonna, we're gonna go through in the next process. Okay, and so what, who is responsible for accomplishing the next process the and housing committee the same committee yes yep. and we have a grant uh funding mapc to help us with that process okay and and, and obviously this has to be done through whatever existing regulations and mechanisms there are so if you're going to propose a zoning change it has to go through Town yeah, meeting. and that's the it other part the planning about it. Board, it has to go through blah, 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 right? Yes. Right. And, the plan, and, and the penalty for not complying with 3A today is certain uh, programs that fund housing development uh, offered by the state. You wouldn't be eligible uh, for those programs. And But there's, through regulation, the governor's office has already expressed that they're going to expand that. One of the programs that they're talking about is municipal vulnerability preparedness, which is, you know, a program we've used a lot uh, for combating climate change. And the attorney general has come out uh, and said that they're going to be trying to enforce the 3A rule very strongly, too. There could be future legislation with additional penalties. We don't know. But they've obviously signaled that they are serious about ensuring that municipalities comply. That being said, it requires a zoning change at town meeting. We don't know. Nobody can answer the question of how those penalties would be enforced when a community proposes a uh, compliant zoning change but fails to pass at a town meeting. So we don't know. Yep. But we're gonna put the effort forward to propose something that's compliant, that you know takes in the feedback from the community like the housing production plan did, and try and you know again hit that window of town needs versus state requirements, propose it and see if we can get it passed at town meeting. So isn't that counter counter counterintuitive? So the first grants that you mentioned were about housing. So the state wants you to do a rezoning for housing for 3A, but if you don't, if you don't comply, they're not going to give you any money to help you with it. Isn't that, I mean, I don't know. That's just the way it, it just sounded like if we didn't comply, we weren't going to get help um, in trying to comply. That's just how it came across. I don't know if that's what what you meant to say or how it how it is, but yeah, no, I'd be it is, and that's one of the things that we've talked about in the committee, and I've relayed to MAPC, and I've relayed at uh, Mass Municipal Association regional meetings 
is that, and, and I've talked to our legislators, is that, you know, that really shouldn't be a penalty. It should be, if you comply, right. you, you rank higher in competitiveness yeah. when you're going for these grants, not the other way around, but, you know, that's the way the legislation was written. <laughs> that's pretty funny. All right. All right. Well, I'm going to I'm going to jump into the silence here. Um, one thing that seems to be lacking or missing entirely here it, in this it, it is is a discussion or or guidelines about finance. Um, you know, and and I I understand that some of it has to wait until you're discussing or, or evaluating specific uh, you know, projects. But should we not in the plan have something about finance? And, and at a minimum, I would suggest one, uh, a discussion that all plans, all projects have to include a financial projection as part of the evaluation criteria. So, and, and I guess I my, my concern is right now this it, it's just completely open ended. It's it's you know it's almost a classic entitlement sort of thing. Yeah, I so, think there's two. Sorry, Michelle, if I can just no, jump no. in before you go. There's there's two separate conversations when it comes up comes to <laughs> finance missing from the plan. And I think it's important that we keep that in mind as we go down through this discussion. One is financial impact to the town, you know, with future developments on these properties, which it's really hard to get to an answer on that at this stage. The other is uh, impact that's specific to the Coast Guard housing property and, you know, impact to the value of the lot due to the plan itself uh, when we go to sell them as individual lots. And I think those are, you know, just keep that in mind as I think that is something that, you know, we can speak to a little bit more through talking to realtors and, and trying to um, kind of understand what the concern is there and adjust for it. Uh, but those are the two different, if, it, if is there a different, that's how I've, categorize the two and if there if i'm missing something please let me yeah, know i think yeah, we're so kind of saying the same, same thing so there's there's a strategy or a policy conversation mm -hmm. which is overarching and there's also a tactical conversation as regards each whatever you want to call it project or effort or yeah, it, so I wouldn't it want to go falls into the latter go ahead michelle I'll shut up so i'm sorry i i wouldn't want to go into detail around financial analysis. Because one of the biggest components of financial analysis for any of these opportunity sites is what are the developer incentives going to be? What, are, what as a town are we going to allow that potentially could be perceived as a taxpayer um, encumbrance? And we don't know what that's going to look like. And to project something like that in the financial analysis, and then someone reads that as a developer can say, oh, if you, if I'm the owner of XYZ property, I could potentially get X percentage in benefits. And I don't want to put something like that in writing and be then held accountable to it because we put a, put a plan together. Yeah, I, I, so, I, I absolutely agree with you. That's in the tactical category. But, too. but I do, I do appreciate that, you know, around trying to have like old, overarching guidelines around like for every opportunity site that is goes forward, right? There needs to be a, a, a financial assessment done, right? That looks at both the, the pros and cons of what the impact will be to the community, right? We need to know what the tax, if, if there's going to be a taxpayer impact, right? And if there's not gonna be a taxpayer impact, what is there a potential revenue impact? Any of these opportunity sites, if they become um, subsidized housing, they're going to be managed by the housing authority. And so they're going to be also, you know, seconded by the state. So there isn't really much of a financial revenue there for the town, right? Because they're operating in, they're operating, uh, 
budget is dictated by the state. Now we do provide some CPC for support for through the housing grants that are available through CPC. And we've been able to help them on certain projects and that will continue because that's in the mandate of CPC is housing and housing is one of the criteria. But um, we've got to be, think, we've got to think about how, you know, if we want to couch the right messaging around that, I just don't want to get too bogged down with it. Cheryl, the, the developments don't have to be housing authority developments, right? No, but what happens if we do a project, a housing project, right? Um, it also depends on the whole criteria and composition. You're absolutely right. We don't know, you know, that we could sell a piece of property to a developer and then, you know, based on the development agreement, X percentage is allowable for, you know, uh, the hot residents and then they go off and they make a, make a profit. But during the time the, the project's being built, they may say, well, I don't want to pay real estate taxes for two years. Right. If I'm going to give you 10% of whatever the project is to Nahant residents, I want to, I want you to forego 10, you know, two years of real estate taxes. Like there's going to be some, someone who's going to ask for something. And then as a town, right, the board of selectmen and, and, and you are going to need to figure out, you know, can we do that? Can we afford that? You know what? And, and to Bob's point, that financial assessment is, is valuable to have, but it would, right. we could do that and afterwards. Another layer. Another layer of that is, uh, you know, public property versus private. Correct. You know, what the analysis, there, there'd be an analysis there when you get, if you're starting with public property, there could be an analysis, an analysis there on, you know, what would the property sell for if we just sold it for uh, non-affordable versus if we didn't sell it versus if we sell it under a development agreement where some of where it's going to count towards our SHI, mm -hmm. so it's really, and then versus private, you're not going to have that comparison because you don't own the land anyway. Right. So what's the financial I mean, impact there? For example, a developer could say, "Yeah, I'll do it, but I want you to pay for the infrastructure costs of the water and sewer." Right. You know, I mean, there could be so many different avenues <laughs> this could go in. Right. So permit that, fees, permit yeah. fees, and things permit like that fees, really the whole bit. So in, in context of this plan, I guess my suggestion would be that we include in the plan a statement that says every project that we're going to uh, evaluate needs to have this kind of a financial analysis. It's going to look at but not limited to the effect on property taxes, the effect on town revenue, the effect on public service, um, you know, and <laughs> et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I think you definitely, I think that's fine. I think we, we could be, we could add something in there related to that. Certainly any public property would come with that type of analysis because you're going to have to go to town meeting uh for the okay and you know i'm i'm sure we would have to produce that for that right how and that would work for a private property for private property we'd have to that i gotta think a little bit more maybe talk to mapc about how that would work okay and then i guess a, a, a question that no what i've not heard anybody articulate directly is, is, is the intent of this, the, the entire plan to be revenue neutral or, or property tax neutral? For and, a town owned land or private land? Um, I don't think we've gone, I don't think we've gone into that. No, we haven't. No, it really hasn't been a mandate of the plan either. Yeah, but it shouldn't. I mean, just because it's not a mandate of the plan, I mean, it's something that's really important. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're you're asking people to, to endorse a plan, and we can't even tell them, you know, what 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 the overarching financial objective, not objective, you know. Impact. But even if we project a financial plan or a financial assessment, right, 
It, I, we don't know. Something could happen could trigger an, an economic change. And then people are going to hold us accountable and say, oh, you anticipated X revenue. But yeah, something, the real estate market fell out. We can't do anything about that. Or some other, you know, we had a natural disaster in town and now we have to put the pause button on any development till we clean up, you know, this natural disaster, whatever it is, you know, just surmising, right? Just, I, I, I well, get so, concerned so about- so many things. Wait, 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 that, that yeah. cuts both ways though. You know, if you don't have something there, you don't have anything to evaluate against and, and be able to say- we, have we don't have to do that evaluation, people. Bob, until we actually narrow down the opportunity sites and actually pick a site to make a determination. Say, say, say we take this list of 10 and bring it down to three or four, right? And then really do that assessment to put forward in front of the voters at town meeting to say, oh, you know, we put this plan together. We've narrowed down the sites. Now here's all the detailed financial assessment for each of these sites that gives you all of the financial components that you need to make the decision. Yes. Yes. And but that, we're back to tactics valuable. and I'm trying to, I'm trying to go above tactics and, and just get a sense as to what, what are we thinking this plan might cost? Well, I mean, I, I would it, think that, it, it I think is, if you think cost the town that, I think it would be safe to say that at worst, at worst, it would be revenue neutral. I don't think the town is going to pursue any sort of development that is, is going to add costs to the town. At worst, it would be neutral. It really comes, it's hard to say you know, it's because it becomes, it's, it's a lot, there's so many variables. Right. No, I, I get it. I, we can't, we can't put specifics against it, but I think as a policy guideline, we need to be clear with the town residents um, what they can expect. Bob, do you think that it's, do you, do you think that we could go so far as to say revenue neutral at worst? That's I guess that it's that kind of a statement that I'm trying to. I know. And I don't know whether I I don't know whether it that's a true whether it is revenue neutral or it's something else. So let me ask this: How important it is to have something of financial? assessment analysis i think what i'm hearing is you would like to have something like a you know for any of these sites you know certain criteria financial recommendations would need to be included yeah does so that I, make sense yeah I, I can be really clear um what you just said so yeah. actually, for every project it should include a financial analysis okay and I think there needs, and this is not the committee, this is Bob Vanderslice, that there needs to be some discussion about, you know, what, what are we expecting or what are we trying to uh, manage to as far as finances uh, as a policy? So I guess the question I would ask is for prior projects so let's let's do the johnson school for example when that johnson school renovation was undertaken what financial analysis or assessment was done and put before the voters before they made made their decision huh. boy i honestly don't remember I, I i certainly there was a call were you on school committee then do you recall i i was oh, that's a peter question well, i, I was never on school committee so. no is that a, is that a question <laughs> no. um I was not on the school committee. Maybe I, uh, I was on the school. I was on the school construction committee. Okay. Um, and there was there was a there was a financial out analysis done, I believe, and it and it was more about the cost of upkeep and maintenance. So, if you recall the the 
elementary school had a long kind of building that went over towards the DPW building. It was one level. It's where the preschool was. And, and so part of the analysis had to do with cutting that off and eliminating it and actually renovating the rest of the school mm -hmm. for better use. So yes, there was a, there was a financial analysis done. I mean, I can tell you Coast Guard uh, Design Development Advisory Committee, we did uh, ad nauseum uh, uh, financial analysis on, you know, current taxes, future taxes, um, sale prices, uh, taxes uh, for the existing facility, the existing houses. And that's why we, we kind of, you know, we, we had our criteria and we looked at, we measured the taxes we would get for the existing building versus taxes for newer new homes. Um, and uh, at a minimum that the uh, ballpark numbers, the, the existing uh, houses were going to bring in like $4,800 a year in taxes. And at a minimum, the new houses, regardless of whatever, were going to bring in 6,800. So there was absolutely a financial um, and, and I know you're, you're probably way too early um, because you don't even, I mean, I mean, we did a financial analysis on, I think just about every one of the considerations that we did because we needed to compare apples to apples. I, I, I mean, is that yeah, something? That's that my you, point. So, and this is great because right. our member, the plan is around housing production. It's about creating housing inventory. So, right. There's an opportunity to create, if you think about ADUs, there's an opera, there's a there's a revenue opportunity there. Oh, when yeah. someone adds an ADU on their property, they're gonna be right. taking on more tax. Yes. So there's more tax income for the town. Yes. So same thing with 3A. If we allow a multifamily to be built, right, there's you know more square footage on a property could drive also property taxes to increase as well. Um on some of the other locations, we don't know yet. And so that's the problem. And that's where design guidelines will be a, a good first step to say, here's some design guidelines for different locations, different criteria of what we wanna have, especially in those private sites. But on the public sites, you know, a lot of that could be dictated again through de the developer, but still gives us a, a, a go forward direction. Cause now we're flipping town owned land to a could be potentially a revenue opportunity, but at an affordability. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, what is any public project, any public project is gonna include the financial analysis that you guys are looking for. Really the, the question is on a private project. If we were working with a private property to do a friendly development. You know, that wouldn't automatically include a financial analysis because it may not require a town meeting vote unless it wouldn't go through the FinCom and we wouldn't go through that process. But what I'm hearing from the Finance Committee is that even if you aren't going through that process, you should still be putting together a financial analysis and working with a private property uh, project which you know we i would say even in that case we would want to do we would want to understand adding x amount of units yes. more people to the town impact to the school impact to public safety services you know we would want to do that analysis in that scenario as well it just may not yeah the form of a something the public the too. it's yeah. something the public is going to be interested in as well Yes. No. Yes. Michelle, Michelle, I'm I'm going to try to orally write a, a sentence for you. It, it's it's the it is the goal of this committee to accomplish this plan in a real estate tax neutral uh, manner. And you can wordsmith it and, and mm -hmm. whatever your goal is. Something like that. Okay. No, I, I got it. I'm taking, I've been taking notes as we've been talking along. All right. I'm off my high horse now. Okay. 
Bob, could you repeat that, please? Because I have to have it exactly for the minutes. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not the sure I can. committee is to create a real estate tax neutral. Got the last part. I can't read my writing. Real estate tax neutral. Overall, to accomplish this plan in a real estate tax neutral manner, some, some, what you know, whatever, it, whatever your your financial goal is. I, I was I was bouncing off of Tony saying he. All right. Um, yeah, and that might be. I'm not the I'm word not. minimum or at least you know might be included in that statement because you know some of these developments could result in. Revenue positive, not revenue neutral. Yeah, yeah, it's it, yeah, and some might be revenue negative. So that's what I mean by the overall. Overall, this is what we're trying to accomplish, and there are going to be puts and takes, and we we deal with that through the financial analysis of the individual projects. Well, well, Bob, you have the word goal in there, which I think is the operative word. That's our goal. Yes. I have an off the wall question. Is the uh, quote unquote Coast Guard um, housing, are there restrictions that would completely prohibit that land from being used uh, to accomplish either of these goals? Just the just the 2021 meeting vote yeah. would be one. Well, I mean, yes, yes. But still, it, it they're going to be put up for development, right? We'd have to undo the... Well, um, subdivision that was completed on the properties because it was one parcel and now it's been just divided to 12 equal lots. Like say, some, say, some, say private citizens puts an article before town meeting to undo the 21, 21 article, right? You'd have to undo the subdivision and undo all of the restrictions for each of the individual 12 house lots because we said they'd only be, you know, 10,000 square foot lots with, you know, 2,500 square foot home right you know there's certain setback requirements and stuff so all of that would have to be undone and if you were considering multifamily, you would have to somehow accomplish multifamily zoning well you'd have to yeah you have to put in a zoning overlay which is right. is exactly what failed the town meeting in 20 2012 2010 2012 yep. i mean 2012 that the the yeah there was a plan to have 28 units in that on that property there were i think at seven or eight houses in a 20 unit like townhouse or condo unit and what was required for that to happen was a zoning overlay and that was the special town meeting where it got basically shot down in flames like i you know it was wasn't even close so yeah, that was that I've forgotten about that, but it just bothers me that if without undoing everything that we've done, there is some way to put some of this space to use, even though it is, you know, divided already up into lots. I I think it's magical thinking though. But it's good thinking. I, I want to double check that with legal. What do you mean? I'm just not sure. I'm unsure if a zoning overlay would be required if you went to town meeting to do a development there for a multifamily project. You know, another way I'm thinking about it is like if a if a private property owner, you know, wanted to develop in an unfriendly manner because we don't currently meet our requirement. They have the ability to surpass our zoning. So would we be able to do that by way of a town meeting article? I just just put a pin in it, Peter. I, I think I want to double check if that would actually be required. Obviously yep. the effort was made back in 2010 or 12 
so there must be a reason for it. But I'm not. Well, our zoning bylaws don't allow for multifamily development. I mean, if, if I know, but when we go to, to like in 2025, a, if we change that bylaw and we create some zoning, I mean, I, I just think I think part of it had to do with uh, part of it had to do with um, if if the developer was going to pull a permit and they don't we don't allow for multifamily, there would have to be a variance on the property. I mean, at least from my recollection yeah, of being on the zoning board. And that's yeah, why they, you might you might be right. I, I just I'm not yeah. 100 percent sure. But if they're doing it in an unfriendly 40B manner, they're going to be able to do it anyway, because we don't we're right. not meeting that threshold. So right. but this was this was a friendly great. development that was happening and we were trying to, right. to get it you know done the right way. Mm -hmm. But that being said, if we wanted to go down that road, we might want to do a zoning overlay because it would also help us accomplish the 3A requirement. So you might want to go down that even if it's not required. Something that uh, we'll follow up on that. Just to keep things in perspective, we've had a fair bit of discussion of uh, the opportunity that exists at Coast Guard Housing. And I want to commend Michelle and her team for getting the, the, the big view from 30,000 feet. And they have a, you know, a, a fairly thankless task to, uh, to come up with something here. Uh, but as I sit here today, the Coast Guard Housing lots are not on the tax rolls. And the swiftest thing that gets us the most money the soonest, both in sale of lots and in incremental tax revenue downstream, is to focus our efforts on Greystone. Well, I mean, there's, yeah. <laughs> well, there's Greystone. The most money the soonest. Oh, hey, no, but there's other Let's problems, that. too. That's I our mean, job. That's our job here. Yeah, yeah. There's that's, a, there's, the that's what we're that's what we're supposed to do right i think this committee in discussion throughout the process you know has thought of graystone as you know probably the the best one to attack first because it doesn't have that historical controversial topic and you have to go to town meeting for either property so it may have a better chance at town yeah. meeting. Um, but the plan doesn't rank them in any particular order. And one of the comments we definitely received from people was that in the goals, it called out Coast Guard housing. The reason it did that was because it was trying to, it heard from the public and from the committee members about the financial aspect of paying off the town's debt and, you know, the folks who were displaced by that effort. And so that's why it was featured as one of its own kind of goal in there. Um, but Michelle and myself and uh, MAPC are working on some, you know, edits because we really didn't rank any of the properties at all. You know, as far as the plan goes. Yeah, I, I noticed that, Tony, and I, I think that as we look downstream of what, what the next steps are in the sequence, obviously this committee is likely to have some uh, some input on the uh, uh, go-forward approval of various plans, and you can make reasonable assumptions of, of what happens at town meeting, and likely any plan is going to have to... Uh, meet a smell test at town meeting, which seems to have a pretty high bar. Yeah, yeah, and, and what they said about Coast Guard housing is really, if the town hasn't accomplished its requirement and therefore does not have safe harbor, and if the town has made itself financially whole, and if there is property remaining, then the town could revisit the subject and potentially use part of that property for affordable housing development. 
Um, and in discussion about that, they really were talking about something similar that had passed back in 2010 or, you know, that was really 80% median income for 25% of the units. And that's how they talked, that's how the committee talked about it over the last few months. But certainly if, if the town accomplishes Greystone Road and a private developer, a private property owner comes forward and we're able to accomplish more, you know, accomplish something with that and we meet our 10% requirement uh, of GLAM, I'm sorry, 1.5% requirement of GLAM, then, you know, there may be no need to reconsider Coast Guard housing at all at that point. Did I lose you guys? No, nope. we're listening. still listening. I think I, the point is, I think that the committee, again, it's a, you're at the widest part of a funnel here and you're throwing a bunch of different opportunity sites out there and you're going to try to find the best way possible to meet your goals. Um, it doesn't necessarily say attack this site first and then that site second and then that site third and, you know, it doesn't get into that because it's too soon for that. I, I, I mean, I, I'm assuming the next step is some sort of pick analysis as to which ones we're going to choose and why. Yeah, I, we haven't talked about that yet. Um, that would certainly come next. I don't see why you know, the town wouldn't want to try to approach uh, some of the private property owners that, um, you know, and just have a discussion with them. Not so much say, we want you to change, but, you know, do you have any plans? Have you thought about it? Where, what's your time, you know, if so, what's your time frame? And factor that information into whether we want, you know, maybe we will, what if we what if we could potentially accomplish this without selling any town on land? You know, so that is probably part of the next step too. Is you know speaking to those folks and finding out, you know, how real that opportunity is. You know, you look at Bass Point Apartments. Um, one of the things we're taught we want to talk to MAPC about is, you know, what if what if Bass Point Apartments converted some of their property, you know, existing property to affordable and the remaining amount being market rate. Would that, you know, without changing the actual property, um, you got to, you know, how would we get Best Point Apartments to be interested in something like that? That's where your financial analysis comes into play, what type of negotiations you would have, but could that be an option too? Um, there's just, I hope you guys are understanding like there's so many different variables and options here and all that, I guess, comes next. May I ask a question, which is, don't we also need to, to factor into this whether or not the time frame and the timing and I guess the rapidity, are other towns, Michelle, already starting to get some of these state grants because they're moving forward faster than we are? You mean after they do their housing production plan? Exactly. Yes. Yes. So you can look at Swan Spot as an example. We've seen lots of activity going on there. They've done eminent domain to acquire property. They're kicking off, you know, affordable housing that's targeting veterans. So it's a good example of, you know, they did their housing plan and they're moving that, you know, trying to accomplish a lot. Um, you know, you some of the residents, down. if you read what's on on social, you know, some residents are, are happy about it. Some residents are like, you know, not happy about it. It's just, you know, part of the divide. Um, you know, Lens also has a lot of development going on as well. Some of it is affordable. Um, some of it's not. Um, but <clears throat> uh, yeah, it, it's happening. It's happening all around us. And, you know, I think we will eventually have something. Um, and hopefully the residents will be supportive of whatever the decisions are. But so what I'm asking is to even be able to get to that, we have to move forward with having a plan 
right? That That's means right. That, that means that Swamp Scott has a plan. That's right. They have a plan and, you know, they're actively applying for grants. Right. They're demonstrating to the state that we have this location, these design guidelines, these specifications, this composition, you know, they're targeting elderly, they're targeting veterans, you know, they're trying to be thoughtful around what they're, what they're doing. Um, and that's where I, I've said earlier, I'm like, we need to have the plan to show to the state to say, hey, if we took Greystone Road, who knows, you know, 15, 20, 25 million dollars, I have no idea, I'm just throwing numbers out. Um, but when we have the design guidelines, then we're going to get more crystallized around that what that financial cost is going to be, you know, and then go to them and say, help us, you know, along with, you know, you know, we can work on identifying the right development partner. So what I'm saying is I think we also financially have to should be thinking about factoring in the sort of I don't know, speed, whatever you want to call it, timing of how we move forward because you talk in the in the draft about comparable communities and swamp scud is one of your comparable communities yes as a context community we, Con we yeah we con that's what you call it right and they're already moving ahead and they're yep. already therefore in the process of getting some of this the state money and yes. we're so i would want us to factor in thinking about the speed with which we proceed because that then brings so, in revenue, right? And I appreciate that because speed is important. The, the challenge we have in our community is we have a town government, a, a town meeting process. So unless once you know we move forward, say the plan gets approved by the state, now it's the responsibility of the board of selectmen working with the town administrator to make certain decisions. Those decisions may require a town meeting we should not wait till the next annual town meeting. We need to have special town meetings, interim special town meetings to bring these to the voters as soon as possible. Once we have all of the analysis done, all of the information so they can make a decision. So when we know there are trigger points like deadlines for grant applications, we can make, meet those. But without doing that, you know, if we wait every year for an annual town meeting, it's going to be a long time before we see um, something kick off. So that's Michelle speaking. Um, and Tony, I'm not trying to put, put pressure on you at all. Um, but these are the things like, you know, because of our town meeting structure, you know, we can't wait a year. We've got to be thoughtful. Like if we need to have plan for four special town meetings, one every quarter, fiscal quarter, then we should probably be start thinking about that to get some of this work done. Right. But the key word in, in your sentence was plan. And we can't do that until we have a housing plan approved by the state. Understood. But just like my counsel is it has to be perceived as we're operating towards a plan, not just, oh, my gosh, another special town meeting. You know what I mean? All I right. think that's one of, one of the things that's absence. Tony, I'm sorry. And I'm, I'm trying not to be disrespectful here. What is absent in our town is a multi-year strategic plan that looks at the broader goals of what we're trying to accomplish, whether it's infrastructure, whether it's climate resiliency, housing, um, what are those things that residents can see, you know, in a way that says, okay, this is coming up. It's a multi-year plan. You know, certain efforts are happening. We don't necessarily see a lot of that happening. We tend to be a little bit reactive to when something gets broke, we got to fix it. We got to go town meeting. We have to ask for money, right? Then we went. Then we have to wait to get the RFP done, find the right, uh, you know, person or development, you know, whoever to do it, fix it, and then we work on to the next thing. I mean, it, it's much better. I'm, I'm not saying it's not. I mean, we've seen some great progress in the town over the over, you know, the number of years that Tony's been here. Prior to that, I would have liked to see more strategic like what's the three-year plan right how are we going to get to climate resiliency in the next three years how are we going to get to improving infrastructure over the next five years right how, how, planning and the housing piece is another piece that's yeah. why we have a planning board and that's what they should be working on but the planning board is limited the planning board is around yeah some towns have a long-term planning committee yeah, right. We don't have that. That's not really the charge of the planning board. It's it's hard. It, it's also hard because we're volunteers. Mm -hmm. um, 
other than um, Allison and Tony, the only two people that are are getting paid here, um, and and maybe I don't know, maybe Josh might be on or or one of the selectmen. They get a dollar a year. I mean, we're all volunteers, and and quite frankly, if you if you follow a lot of these, I've, I've been on committees for most of the time I've lived here in the hunt, and I have to tell you that the same faces show up in the same committees over and over again. There's a very small handful of people that are dedicated and, you know, um, and it takes a, you know, it takes a village. Well, it takes a village to, to move a village. And unfortunately we don't have enough people that, that volunteer and get involved. And it's, it's, it's a reality. I think one of the things, and I don't know who it's going to be, whether it's FinCom, but I think it's a combination of like, FinCon planning, zoning, town hall, board of selectmen, but this should be like an annual meeting that brings those key committees together to talk about what are the strategic priorities that we can look, get it on a whiteboard, right? Get it documented and then try to work towards accomplishing that. You know, there are probably some things the board of selectmen have, there are probably some things that Tony has, but we don't see them in the our board in our board views because we're helping you know, when questions come to us, but to see and be able to help shape that may go a long way. So, Just to speak to that, I mean, our this the finance committee and myself have spent the last five years prioritizing the town's finances to put us in a position to accomplish those things. You know, when we, we've really done a lot slowly but you know we we looked at it five years ago and said we're not going to turn the the ship around in one year you know unless we go to the tax payers for a major override so we're going to accomplish this slowly with better financial policies and we're going to protect our bond rating so that we can accomplish major projects like that and we've obviously accomplished it uh, we're still working on it still doing more every year but we're definitely been heading in the right direction. And meanwhile, the town has accomplished a number of different plans. We've done a, a hazardous mitigation plan. We're working on the housing production plan. We did, um, you know, short-term rentals was a, was a massive planning uh, policy style plan process. Um, Coast Guard housing was another, you know, so there's a, I know the planning board's interested in a master plan. These things take time. And as Peter said, you know, there's a lot of volunteers, a lot of time spent, and there's only so much, there's only so much uh, that our town can take on at, in a given year. And mm -hmm. Michelle, you can see it now, yeah. you know, we've been they working do. on the housing production plan and for seven, eight months now. And, you know, you just, People don't have the ability to tune in, you know, every other week to those community meetings and things of that nature, you know, so you have to spread these things out. It takes time. Um, but I think we're, I think what okay. we've done as a community is, you know, first get our finances in line so that we can accomplish those things in the future. Um, and Bob, I was just going to ask you, since you've been on the committee for a long time, you were, you were on the committee when the Coast are, Guard we are, we are, project. We are light years ahead of where we were. I, yes. It's, it's, yes. It, it's literally order of magnitude. But we are getting like but when way, you were, way, 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 way off topic. Let um, me reel it in. When you, when you were I'm on the... To, Tony, I'm trying to... Been on the, hang on, I'm reeling it in. <laughs> <laughs> So Michelle, I, I think what you threw out there has some merit, and I'm I will take at least the, the action item of having a conversation with Tony, and potentially some of the other um, whatever board and committee heads, and see if this can go someplace useful. Bob, so I think what I'm hearing you say, which I thought Michelle, your proposal of having, you know committees have a joint meeting, which we haven't done. 
that strikes me having also been in an administrative position, you know, department chair, stuff like that. It's a, that's a good, I think that's a useful idea. And is Bob, yeah, Bob is that what you're suggesting? That yeah. You're going, yeah. Well, it, right. But remember, this is in the category of it's, it's a scheme right now. Yeah. It's right. a plan. It's a scheme. Right. So, but it, it may just first, the first step, Bob, maybe it's a meeting of the committee chairs. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, and it has to happen at the balsams and like that. Yep. And but then no. the next section is breaking on, it down. Specifically okay. related to the housing production plan, what I was going to ask you, Bob, was because I know you were on the committee for a long time. So when the when the Coast Guard housing project was presented to the town back in 2010 or 12, I keep I don't remember which year it was. I don't remember. I assume you were on the finance committee at that point. I was. There there must have been appropriations voted on by town meeting years in advance of that to actually hire somebody to come out and look at the property and do that in-depth planning. You yes. know, a study and yeah, then there was conceptual design and then finally the for design criteria there was yeah yes so it wouldn't be you know i don't know where we are right now but if we do make some progress here it's possible that we might be looking at some financial appropriation at the upcoming town meeting to begin that process in accordance with the housing production plan you know, if Greystone Road is something that we want to look at, that might be something that we we want to think about for the upcoming town meeting. And I'm not talking about going to town meeting with a development plan and get approval. I'm talking about an appropriation to hire somebody to help us start that process. Right. But it, it, yeah. And as long as it's done in the context of an overall plan, it's to me, that's entirely appropriate. Right. I mean, we, we, that's i mean it's not just graystone it's it's all it's other property within uh the town that we own yeah. i mean to really look yeah. at you know i mean uh i'll throw the the uh the lowlands the the uh, compost pile i mean it, that's a lot of that's a lot of space that I, I i know you've been cleaning it out tony you've been doing a great job and i believe there's a few committee members here that'll be or actually judy's not here anymore so I don't know um, <laughs> who would have been really happy to see that that 50,000 or whatever it is a year go off the, the books. But, you know, that's a big piece of property that we don't really utilize. I mean, yeah, we have the we have the lobster pots there, but there's a whole lot in the back of that area. I don't know. Does it make sense for beach parking or whatever? I mean, you know, there's a lot of different places in town that can be looked at. Yes. All right, I, I, I want to kind of move the meeting along. So are there more questions by the committee? And if not, we will move on to Citizens Forum. But I want to thank Michelle. Oh, yeah. um, yes. Really, this has been an extremely useful, interesting um, conversation. And you've been able to um, guide us in very helpful ways and talk about spending time, investing time, Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Michelle. Okay. Um, citizens Forum, are there questions from, I don't know how many citizens remain here, a few. There, there aren't a whole lot. So um, I, I think just you know, kind of trying to jump in and ask your question is entirely appropriate. All right, then hearing none, um, I will try, I will convene a, a meeting that will be our organizational meeting. It'll be after Thanksgiving sometime. And uh, I think a motion to adjourn is in order. I make a motion make, to adjourn. I'll second that. Wait, that was Joy. Yes. Peter. Yep. Motion to adjourn.
And then we have to take the vote. Yes. All right. Um, I'll do this in um, Zoom orders. So Vander Slice, aye. Peter? Aye. Aye. Joy? Aye. Dan? Aye. Deborah? Aye. I think that's it. All right. Unanimous vote to adjourn. So we are adjourned. Thank you all. I, I think that was a particularly useful meeting tonight. Very. Very good. Yeah. I really, I meant what I said about Michelle and, sure. and Peter, what you're saying is the same, that seeing people who are willing to give up that kind of time yeah. over and over and over again. Um, right. <laughs> and we're, I've, I've watched it happen for, you know, for as long as I've been here. Um, you, I mean, I'm saying thank you to you too. Oh, I, I appreciate I, it. Um, you I know keep what it hearing is? about another committee that you were on. It's <laughs> like, oh, another one. <laughs> um, school committee, uh, the original Coast Guard Station Committee, school um, construction committee, the golf course committee, the recreation committee. Um, Zoning. He can't even remember Zoning them board. all. Zoning Board of Appeals, um, and and a lot of it's so funny. When I ran for school committee, I remember my wife. I, I said, you know, I want to run for school committee. My wife said, you can run for school committee, but you have to get off of the other because I was on the recreation committee, the school committee, um, construction committee uh, to to renovate the school, and the golf course committee, which was because I was on the recreation committee. And my wife said, you have to get off the, all the other committees and then you can do that. So I did. And then I got my first school committee meeting. I, you know, I sent le letters of resignation and my first school committee meeting, I was appointed to be the liaison on the school construction committee. Again, <laughs> my wife was not happy. Okay, but, I rest, I rest my case. Listen yeah, to you, that list. You know, you, you love, I, I just love the community and, and to, it's it's being part of it and, and making decisions that help keep our town the way it is and, and better our town is what's really important. So but thank you. Thank um, you. <laughs> OK, yeah, Bob, this was a really interesting, very, very great meeting. All right. And I need to extend my thanks to Michelle, too. Yes. She did a great job. Yeah. All right. So, and good questions, well, everybody. And and one more thing that's extremely important. Happy Thanksgiving to everybody. Happy Thanksgiving. Yeah. Happy Period. Thanksgiving. Yes. All right. See yes. you guys very soon. Yep. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.